Just going back to Mr. Stepan Danielian's comment, I think the only idea that I would uh, take over is, is that somebody needs to assume ownership of, of the revolution. One of the ways to assume ownership would have been that two days ago I learned, well actually it was with my consent, that I'm a member of the expert group for, for amendments to the electoral code. I would, should propose a few ideas I want you to discuss. Needless to repeat, any for any democracy to be consolidated, a necessary precondition is to have a mm, competitive partisan system. There's often a confusion here. It's seen often as a traditional democracy. Uh, that that where two parties or more compete and take over the power, but then there are other participatory democracies with a larger number of parties. The parties are less stable, change frequently over time for the players in the party system. But again, the power changes through elections, through participatory competitive elections. Now, coming to Armenia, in the course of Armenian history, the government never changed as a result of competition, electoral competition between parties. Now we have three episodes to, to examine here, if all three were examined. Firstly, what happened in 1990 happened through elections, but the ruling party conceded the power to the movement, which was still becoming a party, it wasn't a party yet. It became a party after it came to the power. Representatives of the movement created several parties. In 97-98, we had this agreement between the leaders of the movement, which resulted in changes in the party composition of the parliament and a change of government ensued, or rather the, the, the power was, was taken, the power bearer changed, and a final episode that we witnessed two months ago, one and a half months ago, again. A situation in which, compared to the past, a party that was in a much more favorable position, conceded first the executive power in a matter of days and then, despite all types of institutional or formal regulations, it also had to, to give up the majority in the legislature about the partisan system and about how it's underdeveloped. Interestingly, in Armenia, we had a situation where and this could be generalized for the whole existence of independent Armenia that could not be a part of the government after conceding the power in all three cases. The third is yet to be seen, but apparently that's what's happening. Can, after conceding the power, they very quickly lost their relevance. Uh, most they uh, disappeared from the political system after one electoral cycle. That's the low level of institutionalization. The other problem then is that even the opposition parties that managed to get into the parliament were very fragmented and they couldn't prove their viability. And I'm sure it's not about individuals being wrong, it's also about the institutional design being flawed. All the opposition parties 
could stay in the parliament for one to two terms at best. So whatever we have today in the constitution, in the electoral code, in the party law, in the design, was designed to really serve the existing party system. But experience showed it's not enough. It's not enough, not effective, doesn't work, and needs to be revised quickly before the next election, irrespective of when it happens. I want to stop here and discuss some of them. Perhaps the most important, uh, the need to have inclusive political institutions. The Constitution now prescribes the notion of stable majority that should make quite easy for any party to have power, at least in the course of one cycle. We, I said it's we prescribed, but I didn't mean it's it's fixed. It got prescribed, it got fixed in the Constitution. I didn't mean we did it. And that the mechanisms for ensuring that stable majority were subsequently prescribed in the electoral code, and there are some artificial mechanisms, some some details like stable majority is 54 percent of the parliamentary seats, and if any party cannot gain it, it is, and then, then there, there is the 40 percent plus party. You know, two parties get 40 percent plus, then the one that got more gets the bonus, so-called uh, bonus number of mandates that will ch ensure it's it's 54 percent of the mandates in the parliament. That, that's this that really runs contrary to this proportional contest. Obviously, it's happening at the expense of the smaller other parties. That's exactly what happened in Armenia, by the way, after the election. But there were more creative solutions. And even if this is not sufficient and somebody gets less than 40 percent, no, no, nobody gets more than 40 percent of the vote, there is a proportional contest runoff second round of the election in which only two parties that get the maximum number of votes will participate. And that's more typical of the majoritarian contest where winner takes all. So that system, that's the logic now also in our current system. It's obvious to me that irrespective of players, irrespective of the party names, this provision should be the very first to get amended. And there's good news here. The good news is, despite the stable majority clauses in the Constitution, that part of that article which uh, refers to the solutions can change by a vote of two-thirds of the Parliament. No need for a referendum it can be changed by Parliament vote. The advocates of this system argue that when we say parliamentary, it's a precondition for manageability to guarantee that the, the executive has enough support in the parliament. Referring to Italy, a country that is known for the instability of its executive, in, under the Constitution this meant to be enacted, but then after the Constitution they decided it's unconstitutional and it was never applied. But our own state experience shows we had episodes where party members changed, some things changed in the, in the parliament, but the executive had really no problem in any case of, of getting enough support in the parliament, most famous being the 97, 98, 99, October 27, and what happened after, or what happened in our days. And as a rule, the executive managed to create a coalition, at least temporarily, and so, through some mutual concessions, get the support of individuals. These were, in some cases, communists, large capitalists, all really voting for the same bill, supporting the executive, and the executive 
having quite a toolkit formally and informally. So the worry about manageability is way inflated. Very briefly on the party financing, serious problems. When we say they cannot institutionalize, there are objective reasons for it too. Th those which are considered well-established parties, as a rule, became well-established using resources of government or large capital. But all the others always had problems with financial independence. And I think it's a good opportunity. When society isn't ready to pay voluntarily for the parties to go about their activities independently of capital, there must be public financing for the parties, I believe. The party financing should be increased with public resources. I probably won't be able to sum up because I have more to say, but I hope to get it discussed later on. Thank you.